as we draw near to the newborn Christ child on this night, we enter into the presence of your holiness. Gathered around your manger, looking through faith upon your face, we are unworthy guests. Yet your very presence in our world testifies to your love for us. You earnestly desire to bring an end to our struggle with our sin that offends and opposes your word. In your grace, you grant us forgiveness for our sins. Confident in the love you have shown us in Jesus Christ, we come to you. People who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior and battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this.
Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. 1 John 4, verses 7 to 16. Was a 
In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Luke 2, verses 1 to 7. Yeah. 
And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. I remember the smell of my grandfathers and their tobacco when I would hug their necks at Christmas time. So I would go over to both of their houses every Christmas and, and I remember the smell of tobacco every time I entered their house and, and hugged their necks. Uh, now one grandfather used to smoke cigars and the way that he quit smoking cigars was he first started just chewing them and then he chewed them like even in the plastic which was really gross but he did it for years until he didn't need them anymore and the other grandfather smoked unfiltered Chesterfield King cigarettes every day of his life until they killed him but I remember that smell. I remember entering their homes on Christmas. I remember the smell of ham in the oven. I remember the smell of mashed potatoes. I remember the smell of wine at one house, and I remember the smell of tea at the other house. But in both those contexts, I remember the smell of tobacco when I came in and hugged the necks of my grandfathers. Now today, obviously, we know that tobacco is bad for you. It'll give you cancer. It'll kill you. And uh, for years, my family smoked around my brother and me. They, they loved us dearly as their grandchildren, but they were, of course, putting us at terrible risk from secondhand smoke. But did you hear what I said? I remember the smell of tobacco, and it reminds me of hugging my grandfather's necks. The smell of tobacco means laughter. It means uh, the little candle-powered mobiles that used to go around and around. It means the, the dogs and, the, and, and too many sweets, and it, and it means too many presents. That's the smell that I associate with Christmas's past. 
I also remember Christmas in Brazil. The first one was very shocking for a kid who grew up in North America. You know, it's the heat of the southern hemisphere in the summertime, and it's the, it's the really out of place Santas wearing their knockoff Coca-Cola Santa costumes in front of a snowy evergreen in the middle of, a, of an air conditioned food court. Meanwhile, the palm trees are gently swaying out in the street in the oppressive heat and humidity. I remember the beach. I remember floating on my back in the waves over New Year's. I remember the all night parties because it's everyone's uh, summer vacation. And I remember the sound of my mother's voice and the pain in her voice over the telephone because I was not going to be home for Christmas. Did you hear what I said? I was living the tropical dream. Meanwhile, my mother felt unfulfilled. I remember the warmth of the fireplace and the blankets and the pillows for all those Christmases that I was at home in Tennessee. Uh, I remember uh, watching black and white movies, old movies with my mom. You know, she was always a sucker for those old black and whites, you know. And we would uh, eat Christmas cookies while we re relived Bill Bailey. And every time a, 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 a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. And even before the Grinch even thought about stealing Christmas, we already had Scrooge's bah humbug and an ethereal ghost whose only mission it was to save you from Christmas's past. But you know, no one's going to save you from Christmas's past. The empty chair of the family member who was off serving in the military or else the empty chair of the family member due to divorce or the empty chair with the family member due to the argument that you had over Thanksgiving and then they didn't come over for Christmas. The first Christmas after your loved one dies, you know, the feeling of turning the lights off in your office two days before Christmas because you lost your job. You can't go back and undo those things and no one's going to save you from those Christmases past any more than anyone's going to help you go back and relive all the good Christmases. You know, you can remember all those wonderful memories, but you can't go back and relive those Christmases. You can't go back again. And everything that we remember, both good and bad, shapes our approach to this celebration this year. In other words, what we remember of Christmas's past has very little to do with the reality of our context. What we remember about Christmas's past has more to do with the connection that we feel than it does the presence and all the food that facilitated that connection. And uh, it has more to do with the feeling of hope and the feeling of safety more than it does the actual reality of safety or even the fact that we really did have real cause to feel hopeful. Because Christmas is a celebration lived in deep feeling, much more than cerebral recounting of history, it means that even in a year like this one, when so much was, it seemed dark and unstable, and, and so much of what seemed unforeseeable and opaque in this last year, even in this year, my daughter, replete with the sun from Brazil that burned her skin, returned back home to the snow of Nebraska and decorated that Christmas tree, wearing the Christmas tree skirt around her waist as if it were her skirt and she was twirling around and singing Christmas hymns softly to herself. I hope I always remember that this Christmas and her blonde hair and that red and white skirt just twirling. I hope I remember that memory for many Christmases to come because every Christmas is in part about remembering previous Christmases past. And the same deep feeling that dictates our memories of Christmases past, the ones that we live both in the good and the bad, are at work even when we remember that first Christmas as well. Think about it with me. You know, we sing songs about how the baby is sleeping in the manger, right? We don't sing songs about how the baby was sleeping. We sing songs about how the baby is sleeping. When we get to this time of the year and we retell this part of the story of Jesus' life, it's always the historical present. 
Jesus is sleeping, and we're still being shaped by how we feel about Jesus sleeping in that manger. Even the gospel writers themselves knew a little bit about how this first Christmas, far past, would shape and affect the rest of their lives, that they would never be free of that very first Christmas. And so when they wrote the story down, they gave us so many of the emotions. They told us how Joseph was afraid until the angel visited him in a dream. They, they told us about how Mary treasured up all these things in, in her heart. They even gave us the sights and the sounds and the smells, you know, those things that really jog your memory. They gave us the sound of the hymns that the angels were singing. They gave us the smell of the animals. And not too far in the distant future, they're going to remind us again of the smell of frankincense and myrrh. And we live in those feelings of connection with one another and with God. And that's what's special about worship services like this one. It's that feeling of connection. These worship services are all about God's children at play. We play out again and again and again how this one Christmas far past continues to shape us in the present. And whether the world seems safe or it seems ridiculously unsafe, whether the world seems like it's in good order or it just you look out and it seems like it's complete chaos, or whether we are celebrating the first Christmas without that person that we love, that their death took a piece of our hearts, or whether we're celebrating that first Christmas with a brand new baby in our lives or a new spouse, we're celebrating Christmas with them for the first time. We feel all those deep feelings over against our deep feelings about Jesus' birth this night. Our lives have been changed forever. On this night, the story of our lives as sinners changed forever. Because all throughout history, the, our story had to be told from the standpoint of the, of the court stenographer. What I mean is, all throughout history, our lives were told this way. We wanted to know at the end of someone's life, if a, if a completely crippled person, crippled emotionally, crippled spiritually, finally had enough good deeds to outweigh their bad deeds. And then the question of eternal bliss or eternal punishment in the afterlife. Or maybe if you were a Buddhist or a Hindu, it was all about the question of birth and rebirth over and over and over again. Always paying down the debt that you had from a previous life. I mean, my goodness, can you imagine the ghost of Christmas past telling you that you've got to pay down all the debt from all those other previous Christmases past? What an absolute nightmare. But now, with the baby in the manger, we all finally take a deep breath and we breathe a sigh of relief because we know that we're never going to be good enough and that God was never waiting for us to be good enough. Instead, He was waiting for just the right moment to deeply embrace us. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God, and it matters because that means that the baby in the manger is God's deep embrace of our humanity. It is God's deep embrace of love for you and for me in the midst of our darkness and our brokenness. Our story changed that night because you cannot earn love. And that's the night that we all found out that God embraces us. What is happening this night is held captive by what happened that night long ago. No one's going to save you from Christmas's past, but it turns out that no one has to save you from Christmas's past. It's a good thing that no one's going to save you from Christmas's past because we were saved one Christmas in the far distant past. And everything you did, good or bad, for every Christmas since then has been kind of caught up in this story of that first Christmas. It's lived in the reality of God's embrace of your condition and of my condition. And every perfect memory you have from past Christmases were made golden by that child sleeping in the manger. And every tear that you shed in the pain of Christmases past has already been taken on by the Son of God who became human like you. You don't need to be saved from Christmases past because the Son of God did not come to live with perfect people or even good people. He came to live with you. And he knew what he was doing. And I don't know how you feel this Christmas. Good, bad. And I don't know how you feel about the larger context this Christmas. You are invited, however, to come in and sit beside the manger and watch the Savior of the world as he's sleeping. 
you are invited to see that one time it absolutely was completely true that a new baby meant that everything in this turned upside down world is actually going to be okay. So, drink another eggnog to this ridiculous year. Toast it. Because Jesus came to save us not by taking us out of the world, but by entering into the world with us. And he is with you tonight. He is still with you tonight. Amen.